Okay, so thanks so much everyone for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our continuing education, sustainable food systems in the era of climate change and pandemics. Can we have it all? Um, so just some uh, kind of housekeeping items for those that are joining us today. This is a webinar, so you'll see you're unable to turn on your video or your mic, and that is purposeful so that we can have as clean of a recording as possible. But you can still ask questions of our presenter. Um, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. So if you're on a computer at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the little Q&A icon. You can click on that and type your questions into the Q&A. Um, if you wanted to just converse with each other, with the other guests that are here, or with me, um, you can put any of that information or those comments just into the chat box. So we'll try to reserve Q&A specifically for questions for our presenter. And please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A throughout the presentation. We will be taking them all at the end, so we don't have interruptions throughout, um, but it doesn't mean you have to wait until the end to submit your questions. You can send them at any time. And if you do have have any technical difficulties, just please put that into the chat box and Jean and I will be monitoring that throughout the presentation so we can help you if there's any issues. Um, Jean, did you want to say hi before I introduce Dr. Fonzo? You're on mute. <laughs> oh, there we go. Hi, hi, Dr. Fonzo. I just wanted to say hello. It was actually um, my husband who recommended you for the talk today because he really enjoyed uh, your presentation that you did for the Applied Physics Lab. So I'm happy to have you here with us. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. So now everyone has face for our name. So please let us know if you need any help. And without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker today. We are so excited to have Dr. Jessica Fonzo from the Bloomberg. She is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global, Pol Global Food Policy and Ethics um, at Johns Hopkins University. We're so excited to have another person from the academia world with us today from another university. Um, at Hopkins, she holds appointments in the Berman Institute of Bioethics, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies. She also served as the Vice Dean and Faculty of Affairs at SAIS. She's the Director of Hopkins Global Food Policy and Ethics Program and the Director of the Food and Nutrition Security Program at Hopkins Alliance for a Healthier World. She's the editor-in-chief of the Global Food Security Journal and leads on the development of the Food Systems Dashboard in collaboration with GAIN. From 2017 to 2021, Jessica served on the Food Systems Economic Commission, the Global Panel of Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition Foresight 2.0 Report, and the EAT Lancet Commission. She was also the co-chair of the Global Nutrition Report Team and Team Leader for the UN High-Level Panel of Experts on Food Systems and Nutrition. Before coming to Hopkins, she has also held positions at Columbia University's Earth Institute and College of Medicine, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the UN World Food Program, Biodiversity International, and the Millenni Millennium Development Goal Center at the World Agroforestry Center in Kenya. Jessica has a PhD in nutrition from the University of Arizona. So as you can see, quite a lot of distinguished uh, moments for Dr. Fonzo. So we're very honored and happy to have you here presenting for our Master Gardener program today. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the presentation. Great. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to, to be here. And I am really glad to see uh, so many people who joined today in the midst of a summer holidays and busy schedules and Absolutely. pandemic, weird pandemic times, not knowing what's going on. But <laughs> yes. so today I thought uh, we could talk about food systems and how they're doing in the face of climate change and the pandemic that we're all dealing with. And can we improve them? Can we make sure food systems work for everyone and do what they're supposed to do with these incredibly vexing global challenges that we have? So I'm gonna highlight five different areas. I'll call them the five R's. One is remembering where we started um, recognizing where we are, 
realizing we need to transform, reflecting on where we want to go, and revolutionizing how we get there. So I'll, I'll talk, I'll divide up the talk into those five areas and, and we'll uh, take it from there. So remembering where we started, I think many of you know that the world was built from agrarian societies and in many parts of the world, farming and agriculture still dominates. It dominates the livelihoods, it dominates lifestyles, it dominates the economic thrust of countries. Um, many, almost every society is built on the back of agriculture and food production. So it's been quite important in our civilization and, and how we've built our societies. But many countries have gone through what we call structural transformation. And I can share all these slides with everyone after if they want to look at some of these figures more closely. <clears throat> A lot of countries have gone through structural transformation and where they've moved away from agriculture and other services, manufacturing, uh, different uh, client services have become significant uh, employment sectors for growing economies. And you can see this, this graph here showing you over time, looking at the, the United States, less and less people are employed in agriculture and more and more people are employed in the services and manufacturing sector, sectors. And this is sort of classic structural transformations that many countries have undertaken in Asia, I think Korea and Japan have gone the same way, where Africa is still quite um, low in, in other uh, business services, trade, transport, still predominantly has a lot of African employment. And Africa is still uh, very much reliant on agriculture as contributions to its GDP, as comp compared to, say, Latin America and the Asia region. So Africa still lags behind, behind not being a bad thing, behind the normal trend of, of less people being employed in agriculture, where in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, some countries you see 60, 70, 80% of people employed in agriculture. And another thing we know from history is that smallholders, smallholder farmers, those living on small plots of land, sometimes less than two hectares of land, still contribute a lot to the food supply they contribute a lot of nutrients to the food supply. And this is just showing you two comparisons of West Asia and North Africa compared to North America, where smallholders still in high abundance in, in Africa compared to North America, which has massive monoculture cropping systems. Um, they're still contributing a lot of nutrients, sometimes up to 80% of the nutrients being produced from these farms. And why is that? Well, those farms are very diverse. Many of these smallholder farms are the custodians of biodiversity on the planet as compared to these large scale monocropping systems. Um, so we've seen this historically, a lot of small farms. We've seen changes towards larger concentrated uh, farms, but um, still smallholders play an important role in feeding the world. We also have a lot of lessons about how we have fed the world. Um, when we think back to, to, to the early 60s, prior to the Green Revolution, which introduced new seed varieties and new technologies into agriculture, there was deep concern that we would not be able to keep pace with the population. We would not be able to grow enough food to feed the world. Well, through technology, innovation, and agriculture policies, we have kept pace with population even more so. So you've seen a significant increase in cereal yield, cereal production, outpacing the world's population and not really extensifying into a lot more land. We use about 40% of all arable land on the planet to grow food. And that largely hasn't, hasn't changed all that much. 
What we've also seen from food systems historically is a decline of massive famines. When you think back to the late 1800s into the early 1900s, there was still significant famines happening in what is now Bangladesh and in India in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, where we saw high numbers of people dying due to famine. And this has waned over the 70s, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. We see less people dying of famine. The last big famine was in Ethiopia in the 80s. Um, that of course is changing. We still are seeing many micro famines and, and this could change even more with climate change. We've also seen that some forms of malnutrition have improved. We've seen reductions in children who are stunted. Children who are stunted are short for their age, but they're chronically undernourished. This can be debilitating for life. And we see that in the world, the number or the percentage of stunted children has gone from 33% in 2000 to 22% or about 200 million children under the age of five to 150 million children. That's a significant improvement. Uh, what we've seen increase is the number of children under the age of five who are overweight or obese, that's shown in purple. Um, we've seen a rise in obesity in young children with declines in undernutrition. So that's, that's progress. And if you look at a place like India, and this is a, a map of India showing you 2000, 2010, 2017, the red being very high burdens of stunting. You see the decline over time of stunting in the subcontinent to coming down to less than 20%. So progress has been made and it's important because India has some of the highest burdens of undernutrition in the world. So that's just looking in the past, not all bad, right? Not everything is bad, but where are we now? So let's, let's take a moment to recognize where we stand. So I'm gonna depress all of you a little bit, but hopefully it'll be uplifting in the end. We've got significant megatrends that are shaping our future. This is a graph showing you uh, from the World Economic Forum showing some of the big risks, and these are in different color diamonds. The red is societal risks, orange is geopolitical risks, green is environmental risks, blue economic risks. And the, on the outside, the diamonds are uh, showing you the strength of these different challenges or trends and how they link to risks and, and, and the severity of those. And we've got lots of issues, you know, breakdown of multilateralism, nationalism, polarizing societies, rising inequities, geopolitical shifts. And these are all playing out in different ways and in, in influencing environment, economic uh, uh, equity issues. We also have climate change, degrading environments, urbanization, migration issues. These are all influencing and creating significant risks of how we are able to adapt as a society. Well, one of the big things we need to recognize and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or also known as the IPCC report just came out the other day. I'm sure you're all seeing a lot of news about climate uh, change in the media. Um, we are on a trend of significant catastrophic climate breakdown. We're in the middle of it, it's happening. And when we look across all of the indicators of climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, these top three, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, other indicators of environmental degradation and climate change, increases in surface temperature, increases in ocean acidification, collapse of biodiversity, increasing deforestation, you see all of these trends as like a hockey stick. It's just, whoosh, everything is going up, many of it in the wrong direction. And the alarming thing is the pace of change in the last few decades. We've seen a significant rise in 
uh, global warming, uh, rising sea levels and greenhouse gas emissions in the last two decades. And most of this is due to us. We as humans are, are some of the biggest influencers. We have the biggest footprint on these earth processes. This is what is called the Anthropocene, which defines the Earth's most recent geological time period that is human influenced. We, in the decisions we make every, every day, are the most significant contributors to climate. And that's our population growth, it's our economic growth, it's our use of energy, use of water, use of telecoms, our use of paper. Uh, our use of, of, of transportation, it's, it's all of the way we live our lives is making contributions to climate change. We also need to recognize the complexity of food systems. This is a diagram of food systems. It's very busy, but it really shows you the complexity that food systems are. In the middle gray box are the components of food systems. You have food supply chains. Food is produced or raised on farms. It's packaged, it's processed, it's transported to retail markets. It th then hits what we call the food environment. This is the place where you as a consumer, you walk into a market, you walk into a restaurant and you make a decision about what you're gonna order and buy. You bring with yourself all these individual factors. How much do I wanna pay? How much knowledge do I have about, about food? What are my aspirations and desires? What kind of foods do I prefer? But the food environment is also influencing your decisions. What kind of food is on offer? How much does it cost? Can I afford it? What's the branding? What's the marketing? Where's the food positioned in the store? Is it at the front, like candy bars, where you're at Trader Joe's? can't stand that. All the chocolates there while you're standing there waiting in line. All of these choice architecture elements are shaping your dietary decisions. And this influences your diets. It influences the kind of consumer behaviors you have. And on the right are the outcomes that we expect from food systems. We want them to be environmentally sustainable. Food systems very much rely on the environment. We want them to have better nutrition and health outcomes. We want them to have economic and livelihood outcomes. We want them to be equitable and inclusive. And along the left are all these drivers that are shaping food systems in different directions. Urbanization, climate change, politics, population growth, migration, globalization, trade. These are all exogenous to the food system, outside the food system but highly influencing the directionality of food systems. We also need to recognize who's going to feed us. And I like this quote from Ruth DeFries. She's a professor at Columbia University. 12,000 years have passed since we began to transform from forager to settled farmer. It took several thousand years of learning and culture before the transition was nearly complete. The twists of nature that human ingenuity devised have ratcheted up step by step our dominance as farmers on the planet. Now we are transforming from farmers to urbanites, our newest experiment to feed massive numbers of people from the work of a few is just beginning. The outcome is yet to be seen. Who is going to feed us if everyone is moving to urban places, which they are, and the average age of the world's farmer is 62. Who will feed us? Who will feed the 10 billion people? It is a question that is very much unresolved. We also need to recognize who controls the food system? Who is shaping it? Who is controlling the kind of foods on offer, where they're sold, and what kind of packaging? Well, there's 1.5 billion producers. There's now almost eight billion consumers or eaters. But if you look along the middle of the value chain, you know, the traders, the processors, the packagers, the retailers, 
that is controlled by a very small number of transnational companies. They're concentrated and they really control that whole middle part of what's called the value chain, where the value is added to food. And there's also a significant concentration of the, the, the companies that are controlling the inputs, the agrochemicals, the breeders, the seeds. You can think Bayer, you know, few companies that are controlling a lot of the inputs that go into farms. So are governments in control of their food systems? No, it's private sector. Private sector and all of its facets and all of its many shapes from very small businesses to large scale are, are really uh, shaping food systems in different directions. So let's talk about realizing that we need to transform. Well, how are our food systems faring? Well, let me present a couple of just snapshots of, of issues that relate to our food systems. One is that we need to realize that food systems are contributing to global greenhouse gas emissions and environmental stress. Food systems contribute to about 30% of all greenhouse gases in the world. So it's not just energy and transportation, food systems and the way we grow our food and the kinds of foods we grow are contributing to greenhouse gases. They're also using a lot of, of the fresh water resources. Agriculture uses about 70% of all fresh water resources. We have about a million animal and plant species that are now threatened with extinction and 60% of fish stocks are maximally fished. So we have significant issues. A lot of the greenhouse gases is coming from not only cows and their, their production of methane from their enteric fermentation when they burp, um, but it's also coming from just growing staple crops, uh, from land use changes, deforestation, and the movement of food around the world. We also need to realize that if we continue on growing food in the way we do and consuming food in the way we do, this business as usual, we will not meet the Paris climate change targets. So that's shown in black as this business as usual. By 2050, we will hit two degrees. If we make changes to our diets, shown here in the plant-rich diets, we'll be able to stay below 1.5. Still a changed world, but we'll stay below. If we take other practices like um, improving sustainable practices on farms, cutting food waste in half, We'll stay below two degrees, but not below 1.5. And this last gray bar shows that if we improve on diets, sustainable production practices, and waste less food, we would stay below the, the climate change target. We, we'd, we'd, we'd reach that target. And so it argues that food systems are critical to, to take action on. We also need to realize that the multiple burdens of malnutrition and food insecurity are massive and universal. Oh, this first statistic is, is outdated. We now have 811 million people who, went, who are going to bed hungry. That number increased in one year from 690 to 811 million due to COVID. Incredible. We have 150 million children who are stunted, what I talked about earlier. You could argue that's not a lot of people in the world, but that's actually 20% of the world's children who are under five. They will never reach their full potential. They are stunted, very difficult to change and reverse. 45 million children are acutely malnourished due to seasonal hunger, micro famines. Um, they have a very high risk of dying. And we have 2.1 billion people who are overweight and obese, which is incredible. And this map on the right shows you countries that are dealing with multiple burdens of malnutrition. They're dealing with undernutrition and overweight and obesity. Very complex to try to tackle for governments. We also need to realize that diets are now the top risk factor of disease and death worldwide. Isn't that incredible? Diets that are meant to nourish us are now killing us. These diets are suboptimal. They're low in fruits and vegetables, 
low in legumes, nuts and seeds, high in sugary, salt, highly processed foods. And it's killing people around the world. These, most of the deaths are cardiovascular related, or, but also diabetes. But if you look at these top five risk factors, many of them are associated with diets, high blood pressure, diet, dietary risks overall, high fasting glucose, um, also a, a diet risk, high body mass index. So diets is now uh, higher uh, in, in increasing of disease and death risk as compared to alcohol use, smoking, air pollution. It's, it's pretty incredible. We also need to realize that zoonotic pandemics are not going away. Some have asked, is this the long awaited big one? Is it? We don't know. It seems like it. Why, do we, why does this have to do with food? Well, COVID-19 is likely a zoonotic disease due to a spillover event that jumped from animals to humans. Now, most of infectious diseases, about 60%, are zoonotic. And of that 60%, about 70% originate in wildlife. Well, wildlife live in these natural habitats. These natural habitats are being shrunk or destroyed, a lot of that due to agriculture and urbanization. So we are either killing off wildlife or we're putting them in closer proximity to humans or domesticated animals, increasing the risk for these spillover events. So agriculture and our food production systems have a big role to play in increasing zoonotic risks, but also potentially protecting us against zoonotic risks. We also need to realize that food systems are vulnerable to shocks. We've got a lot of shocks, a lot of extreme weather shocks happening. Think about the wildfires in California or Southern Europe droughts, floods in Europe right now. These create shocks to the system um, that can create problems with wiping out massive uh, crops, force people to migrate. Um, same with monocultural vulnerability. Monocultures are extremely vulnerable to pathogens and can wipe out um, you know, vast numbers of crops. So food systems are incredibly vulnerable to different shocks in this, in, uh, across the board. Another realization is that people are on the move. People are changing. You know, we largely were agrarian societies, you know, and, and very few of us live that life anymore. Most of us live in urban places. We're getting education. We're, we have a vast number of foods to choose from. And there's something called the nutrition transition as countries and people urbanize and uh, change their lifestyles, they move from this sort of smallholder rural famine with very little variety of foods, high burdens of undernutrition to overweight and obesity, eating a lot of street food, highly processed packaged foods. You don't move around so much or more sedentary. And most of the world has shifted to these other, pa other patterns. Most of the world is 5 billion roughly are living in peri-urban and urban environments where they're not moving around so much and they're consuming on the go foods that are not necessarily healthy. And their disease epidemiology shifts from undernutrition to overweight and obesity and non-communicable diseases like diabetes, stroke, and heart disease. And this has been a trend we've seen over decades in almost every country. Every country is on this trajectory. Very few countries have been able to stop this trend. We also need to realize that inequities are deepening and plague progress to move forward. When we look at the percentage of people who cannot afford a healthy diet, it's vast. About 3 billion people, 3 billion, 40% of the world's population cannot afford what is considered a healthy diet. And you can see the places in the world uh, where uh, up to 75 to 100% is in the dark brown, cannot afford a healthy diet. That's incredible and creates significant inequities. 
And we know that with COVID, obesity um, is very much uh, tied to inequities and social determinants of health, um, access to healthy food, access to health care, access to physical activity, uh, has really shown its true colors and obesity being a significant risk factor of COVID. And we've seen the health disparities um, play out here in the United States. So there's significant inequities in who gets access to what kinds of foods based on the color of their skin, based on their tribe, their ethnicity, their caste, their creed, uh, their disability. We've seen a lot of, of that shown through in COVID, um, and, and we've always seen that in food systems, unfortunately. And we've really, um, those inequities and social injustices have played out, particularly in the last two years with the Black Lives Matter, hashtag Me Too movements that have drawn light to these uh, systemic uh, inequities um, that, uh, are in need of uh, being remedied in the long term um, and in an empowering and impactful way, as opposed to just these kind of uh, quick fixes. So, what does a food system transformation mean exactly? What are we talking about? We want food systems to transform. Well, we want them one to ensure availability, access, and affordability to sufficient, nutritious, desirable, safe diets for everyone. That's one big transformation. Another is to produce food from more sustainable food systems, taking on more sustainable practices, not running the earth to the ground just to ensure we feed the world's population. We can promote uh, fair and equitable livelihoods. Um, that's another ensuring people have fair wages, that they have uh, dignity in the work that they do, um, that they're recognized by their work. We know that many who work in the food system are the most food insecure in the world. And of course, we want it to benefit nature. Food systems very much depend on nature. Nature depends on food systems. How do cre we create more ecosystem services in, in the kind of food systems that we have? But the question is, are we asking too much from food systems? Can we have it all? Can we, can we tackle everything? Can we have all those lofty goals of food systems transformation? That's, that's the big question. So let's reflect on, on where we want to go. Um, this is a quote from Joan Didion. Many of you might know her, a great writer in, in, a, in a, a story called uh, that she had written about leaving New York. She was moving to Los Angeles. The story begins with, it's easy to see the beginnings of things and harder to see the ends. And it's easy to see where we are. It's easy to see how food systems have progressing, but do we know how things will end? Do we know if we can get to better food system transformation? And that's, that's the golden question. There's been so much attention on food systems in the last couple of years but very little action. There's been so many reports. I've been a part of some of these, maybe some of all of you have been a part of these reports, recommending different actions to take to improve human and planetary health, but very little action has been taken by governments and by private sector. So one thing we need to do is focus on the entire system. When we think about production all the way to consumption, there's a lot of focus on how do we produce food more sustainably and in, in a more nutritional, uh, more nutritional way, and how do we change diets? But there's very little work in the middle of the value chain. How do you ensure that transportation is more sustainable? What about processing and packaging? How do, we, how do we change that middle of the chain? And that is critically important. One thing we need to do is get over our staple fetish. We have over 400,000 plant species, about 5,500 crops that are consumed by humans historically, and three crops provide 30 or 50% of the world's calories, rice, maize, and wheat. 12 crops 
together with five animal species provide 75% of the world's food supply. We've lost the diversity of what we grow in the world. And that is a significant issue nutritionally, climate-wise, biodiversity-wise. So we've really shifted away from traditional crops grown all over the world. Think uh, sorghum and millet, indigenous to Africa, have been replaced by rice and maize. Um, many of the indigenous crops of South America, you could think quinoa, others that have become mainstream crops, which is great, but that's very few. But we've really seen a shift towards these major crops, maize, rice, wheat, sugar, oil, edible oils, palm oil, um, and a few varieties of, of animal foods. And most of the research done looking at the impacts of climate change on the nutritional quality of crops or on uh, how crops will fare in a two degree or three degree world um, has been done on staple crops, not on uh, nutritious crops like fruits and vegetables and legumes and seeds. So we need a lot more research looking at more nutritionally relevant crops. And we also just need to shift what we're growing. On the right is showing you what we grow around the world, about 40% cereals and starches, 16% sugar, 11% oils and fats. But on the left is what we want people to eat, which there's a real mismatch between what we should be eating and what's actually being produced. And a lot of that has to do with agriculture subsidy policies, trade policies. So we really see this mismatch between what's grown and, and what we want on our plate. And how do we deal with trade-offs of trade policies? Trade is really important. It moves nutrients around the world. This map is something we did showing you that if we didn't have international trade, you'd see significant increases in nutrition deficiencies, energy deficiencies, iron, protein, and zinc, with the red and orange being higher deficiencies. So trade moves nutrients around the world. Very, very important. It also moves highly processed packaged foods that are detrimental to health. You know, all of the long shelf life foods, of course, and these are in high demand. They're tasty, they're convenient, they're cheap. And these are growing across every region of the world. And trade is moving those foods around. So there's real, there's positives and, and negatives with trade policies. We also have the issue of animal source foods. Um, this was the Eat Lancet uh, report that we did um, showing uh, a healthy diet is the orange circle, a healthy diet that's good for humans and good for the planet. Um, and this is showing you the diet of North Americans and what they consume by food groups and whether or not they stay within the boundary of what we need for human health that stays within planetary health. And you can see that in the US, we eat, we eat a lot of red meat. We eat a lot of starchy staples, a lot of potatoes, a lot of eggs, a lot of chicken, a lot of dairy. Pretty highly environmentally intensive foods. Um, whereas Sub-Saharan Africa, much different, right? A lot of starchy staples, but they are, they're fine on red meat, but both don't consume enough of the good stuff, the fruits, the veg, the legumes, nuts, and seeds. So there's a real inequity here. What do we do about this? What do we do about countries that are consuming way more animal source foods than they need for human health? And some countries that just don't get enough of it. They don't get any of it. So there's a real inequity there. And there's a lot of debates on animal source foods, and it's a very contentious issue in food systems. What do we do about this? What kind of system do we have for livestock? What kind of diet should the world eat? What are the substitutes if people move away from red meat? And each of those decisions, there's trade-offs. So livestock sector, very important for many people's livelihoods. What about alt proteins? Are they healthy? Are they sustainable? What about the idea of some countries who never got access to meat? Well, maybe now it's their turn to eat meat as they become wealthier 
as Africa grows its middle class, maybe they want to eat meat now. It's their right to do that. China, what do we do? There's people arguing that I've never felt better eating an all meat paleo diet. That's, that's the kind of diet that I want. It makes me feel good. What do we deal? How do we deal with that? When we know it's a global, we are all in this together kind of problem. What about growing livestock? Big threat to deforestation and biodiversity. It's a significant threat. So we have big trade-off issues around how we deal with this idea of sustainable diets, particularly when it comes to animal source foods. And there's no easy answer. When we looked at the Eat Lancet diet, this very plant-based diet, I showed you the rings, um, what would the agriculture system look like? What would food production need to look like if the world were to eat that Eat Lancet diet, very plant-dominant diet, um, now the yellow bars are showing you in 2050, the world keeps eating the diet it's eating and we keep wasting 30% of all food produced. And you see the kinds of foods that we need to grow. You'd see growth in the poultry sector. You'd see growth in fruits and veg sector, whole grains, red meat growth. You'd see, you continue to see growth in almost every food group. Now in green, is if the world ate the Eat Lancet diet and cut waste in half. Look at the significant changes of our agriculture system. No increase in cereal production, which is what the world mainly grows. We'd have to increase fruits and vegetables 75, 50%. Red meat production would decline 65%. So that's a loss of livelihoods, a loss of that sector in a significant way. Fish, 50%. We're running out of wild catch, so we'd have to go with aquaculture. Legumes, nuts would have to increase uh, significantly. So this would have to be a massive change in the kind of foods that our agriculture system produces. And we also think, need to think about consumer demand and what would incentivize people to change their habits. We know that ultra-processed food and drink products are increasing, with the exception of North America which is declining. But most regions of the world, they're seeing an increase in these highly processed packaged foods. And we still do not know the environmental impacts of those foods. It's not a lot of work on their footprints. So if we know this is the demand, you know, what does that mean for the kind of diets that we should be ensuring are healthy? And another question is, does environmental motivation for dietary change, is that, is that, does that, are people motivated by wanting to change the environment? Maybe some of you are, others are not. You know, some people are not motivated to change their diet because they want to address climate change. Just like another person may be motivated to change their diet because they care about animal welfare, or they care about their health, or they care about uh, fair trade. You know, does the environment motivate people to want to change their diets? And that's a big question. And another question is who needs to make bigger changes? This is showing you in the light uh, blue is current emissions coming from national diets. And the blue is if uh, the, emission, the emissions coming from uh, if, if people ate what was recommended in their national dietary guidelines. And you can see in Argentina, the current diet versus consuming what's recommended, they would come down significantly in their greenhouse gas emissions. But in Bangladesh and Indonesia, they really don't have to make any changes. Their current diet matches what's in their national dietary guidelines from a greenhouse gas emission perspective. The point being, there's some countries some populations, some households that need to make bigger changes if they want to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions compared to other places in the world. United States being one. We are the largest greenhouse gas emitter per capita in the world and our diets play a huge role. And another question is what options are ethically permissible and acceptable to consumers? Lab-grown meat, will everyone accept that? Probably not. 
Will people eat insects? Do people like these plant-based foods? Um, do they find them over-processed? These are these questions that we're left wondering, are consumers going to accept these alternatives if recommendations are made to reduce their red meat consumption? And we need to learn from the long awaited big one, COVID-19. So many lessons to be learned from COVID. Uh, you know, a health shock, a health system shock impacted food systems in a significant way, along with every other system, the education, the economic systems. But what we've learned is that even during COVID, food supply have remained pretty stable um, and trade is, has been open and flowing. But what's really key is supporting and protecting the food system workers. That became very apparent that they were not appreciated, not protected, and marginalized. And so that was a big lesson coming out of COVID. And another is around um, ensuring that we've got better um, surveillance to monitor pathogens, which doesn't really exist now. So revolutionizing how we get there. So one, one big question is, you know, are we gonna see changes? Is a change gonna come? This is Sam Cook, some of you may know. Are we, gonna, are we gonna be able to make the changes to our food system to have all of those outcomes that we want them to have? It depends. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on the decision makers. Can they prioritize food systems? Can they cooperate? We need evidence, we need to continue to generate it, we need to share it, and we need to use it. We're at a time when evidence and data is being scrutinized, disregarded, science is, is suspect. We need to continue to push this, the scientific frontiers of, of generating and using and sharing evidence. We need more political will from governments. We need them to be bold. We need them to govern food systems. And we need to ensure that those who do not have voice and do not have agency are empowered to have voice and agency. We need to ensure that the marginalized and disadvantaged of the system are in the driver's seat of how we shape food systems in the future. We need to negotiate with private sector, figure out how we can make changes, incentivize changes with private sector. And of course, um, data to, continue to inform future scenarios of how decisions are made. So we've got more knowledge than ever before. We know what to do. Uh, this top uh, picture is showing you um, uh, an article in the New York Times in 2018 talking about how climate scientists presented all the climate data to the US government in the 1970s. And look where we are, the data was ignored. Same with space, the Space Shuttle Challenger. Some of you may be too young, maybe some of you are my vintage of when that blew up. NASA was warned by scientists about this potential catastrophe. So we have knowledge. It's using that knowledge to take bold action. And we have tons of it. So how do we get policymakers to take action on that knowledge and that evidence? That's a big thing. We have lots of data to help policymakers, but we need to present data in a way that works for policymakers. We need to sit at the table that they set, not the one that we want them to set as researchers or scientists. We've developed something called the Food Systems Dashboard. I encourage you to go to that and try to pull food systems data together in easy, understandable, visual ways for, for policymakers. We can't give up on research and evidence. As I said, you know, evidence facts are being disregarded by politicians and business leaders. Um, but we still, research has a huge role to play and it can bring about wholesale changes in attitudes, political thought and action. We have political momentum. Food System Summit is coming up in September in New York. Biggest summit ever on food brings together all the actors, every country will be present, private sector, some civil society. It's contentious, it's a contentious summit. Some are boycotting it because of the role of private sector in it and the lack of inclusion, but it's an important moment to try to get governments to take action. 
We have guidelines that have been um, endorsed by the Committee on World Food Security that help countries in deciding which policies they want to take up. It's a set of guidelines to move towards more sustainable food systems. And this document's quite important because every UN member state agreed to the document and the language within. It defines what's a healthy diet, what are sustainable food systems, and a set of about 100 guidelines to help countries move in a positive direction for food systems. And we have so many opportunities to make an impact. There's so much data and so many great studies out there and uh, programs out there, NGOs who are doing incredible work. It's a matter of investing in those and scaling them up and, and getting them um, on the front pages of, of the New York Times and the Guardian of, of what works. And there's so many of these different programs that have done incredible work moving the needle towards uh, positive impacts. And we have youth and elders on our side. We have a lot of older people who work in agriculture. Um, and we have a lot of young people working in agriculture and food systems. And their breadth of knowledge and innovation and tools of the trade are the key. And they should be leading the path forward. We should be listening to our elders and listening and engaging youth. And they are, to me, the two most important groups um, that we need to um, guide discussions and, and lead the path that we want to see forward. Elders have the history. They know what's worked and what hasn't worked. And youth have the aspirations and innovation on their side um, to, to push things forward. So to me, it's, it's a matter of coming together. You know, we, there's a lot of people working on food systems. The summit's gonna be a moment to, to come together and take action. Um, but there's gonna be elephants in the room at that summit. Um, the political environment, the lack of investment, the lack of capacity to deal with these very complex issues, um, ensuring that movements, coalitions, and networks are engaged, ensuring that we put human rights first, ensuring that governments are sitting at the table equally or more so than private sector. Private sector has so much power in the food system. How do we get some of that back? And mitigating some of those conflicts of interest that often come with some of the private sector engagement that many of us have to, to balance. And I will end there and I really look forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I must say there were so many amazing comments in the chat box during your presentation, which I'm sure that you couldn't see, but folks were really interested in this presentation. Um, I have to concur. There was so much great information and I love the way that you really connected everything with the big picture and made it incredibly relevant to all of our lives. So it was awesome. Thank you for that. So at this point, folks, we are going to move into our Q&A session. Um, we have two that are in the Q&A box as of right now. If you did have anything else that you wanted to ask, uh, please feel free to put that into the Q&A box now. But I will go ahead and get started with our first one, which I think is a great question and all of our audience would be interested. Um, how can our master gardeners help? Is it through our programs like Grow and Eat It that encourages the master gardeners and other folks in our communities to grow their own food that they can eat? Absolutely. I mean, you are all walking the talk. I mean, this is exactly where it starts. I mean, these community, community engagement, learning how to grow food, how to you know, how to compost, how to, um, how to use food and cook food. These are all like so critically important. And we've tried to, they, they've tried a lot of programs in um, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where I've worked a lot and South Asia to replicate these, these community gardens. Um, th this is central. Um, so to me, you are at the heart of food systems in a sense. Um, and you're walking the talk, you know, mm -hmm. difficulties in growing food <laughs> seasonally. And I mean, you know, you know, dealing with pests and dealing with hundred degree weather, you know, I mean, you know, all of these things. So this is sort of the, the, the bread and butter of, of, of this talk is, is 
starting at the community level and building up and out from there. Um, this top down, I, I, I obviously work much more globally now, but mm -hmm. that kind of top down is not often getting filtered down to communities. Right. Like for example, the summit is, are local communities gonna care about what happened at, at the damn summit? Probably not, right? It's, it's what happens at the community level that's gonna be most empowering to, to individuals. So awesome. the work that you're all doing is incredible. I wanna, yes. I wanna come and visit you all and have like a day with you. Yes, point. absolutely. There's so many incredible demonstration gardens throughout the state to look at. Um, and related, one of our other guests said that they're practicing permaculture. Um, and their question is, is it naive to think that every community can have their own food security through locally produced perennial food and water capture? Um, I think it's it's not naive. I think, I think we need to do a lot more of that. And I love the mm -hmm. permaculture um, mm -hmm. model. Now, can it be done everywhere? It's, I think it's challenging in some place, very highly urbanized places, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, urban slums and some parts of the world, um, the, the land is not suitable or it's unsafe to actually um, be out by yourself or the land has been contaminated. Um, so yeah. not ideal everywhere, but uh, it, we certainly could use a lot more of it than we have now, but there's going to, and then there's environments that are like very just drought prone. So the water issue is huge in places like the Sahel where it's hard to grow things, you know, so, so maybe thinking about different kind of models, different kind of sustainable livestock models, for example. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We had a related comment from one of our guests in the chat box and they were mentioning the challenge of um, helping inner city neighborhoods to get good, nutritious food. I know that food deserts are issues that a lot of our master gardeners are working on and um, also teaching the children in those areas and really anywhere where their food comes from. And food swamps. Mm -hmm. the food swamps are where there's just unhealthy food outlets everywhere, right? So it's not that there's not any kind of market which exists like the food desert situation, but there's there's food, but it's, you know, you're buying it at the liquor store or, you know, like Penn, I don't know if any of you, I, I'm from New York. I don't know if any of you have been to Penn Station. Penn Station is a food swamp. <laughs> there's like <laughs> very hard to find anything to buy that's healthy there. Um, that makes sense. Food swamps are a much bigger issue than food deserts, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, the next question also kind of related. What is one thing that someone who's watching this webinar today, what can we do to help? Lots. I mean, at the individual and household level, you know, thinking about the way you use food, you know, wasting less food, using your freezer, if you use, you know, eating leftovers, um, using uh, discarded food scraps for broth, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, thinking about the food waste issue. If you can compost, that's wonderful. Can't mm -hmm. compost everywhere. Again, like New York City, you can't compost with rats, yeah. the rat situation. Um, your diet, you can make changes mm -hmm. to your, your household diet, um, moving towards ensuring that you have more plants on your plate, um, uh, trying, you know, and if, if you're not, if you really like meat, try some other cuisines that are more vegetarian based like Thai or Indian food, mm -hmm. very tasty, predominantly vegetarian. Um, it's kind of an easy entry into vegetarian foods. Mm -hmm. um, like, working in community gardens, teaching young children. Children are, you know, that, that school-age children, they're so um, prime for being, mm -hmm. uh, taking up new knowledge at that. Their taste buds are developing, such a great time to interact and, 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 and have lifelong lessons for, for children at that age. Um, Absolutely. And, and that, that, and I think someone, Dave had mentioned that 
um, Mm -hmm. teaching Mm -hmm. children where their food comes from. So important. Yes. Um, Absolutely. There's a lot you can do at the end of the Yeah. Journey. Lots of options. I feel like that's the good news that's coming from all of this is that everyone can help. And there are so many different options that everyone can take. The thing is, Stephanie, every day you walk into the food system, mm-hmm. you engage with it multiple times a day. You make a decision, right? And I think people don't realize the power of your decision. Absolutely. Private sector answers to consumer demand. They don't answer mm-hmm. to government regulation, right? Mm-hmm. Think of that power that you have. And, and you don't interact with every system, well, maybe some of you with the education system, but we don't interact with the health system every day, hopefully mm-hmm. not, unless you work in it. Um, but you interact with that food system every day in your That's decisions a great point. matter, right? Absolutely. So what you can do. Thinking about your purchases, you know, if you care about animal welfare, get to know the kinds of companies that care about animal welfare. If you care about fair trade, look for fair trade Mm -hmm. labor. If you don't want to consume unsustainable palm oil, look for that certification that's got the sustainable red palm oil uh, or sustainable Mm -hmm. oil um, production. So there's lots of things you can do every day in your choice. And of course, voting for the right policy Makers. (laughs) Makers. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so our next question was referring to a slide that was pretty early on in the presentation, and it noted the changes that were needed in our food systems to meet the 1.5 degree temperature change for our climate targets. Is that assuming that there's no other changes made within the fossil fuel industry, or what other changes were kind that's of taken assuming, into that? That's assuming that cha- the changes agreed upon in the climate meeting the mm-hmm. national uh, agreed upon uh, goals are being met. Okay, awesome, thank so you. If those were all met and nothing happened in food systems, we wouldn't meet the Paris Agreement. So if, if we went all renewable energy worldwide mm-hmm. and we still didn't do anything about the food system, we wouldn't meet the Paris Agreement. So it shows, the point of that is that that COP meeting and continuing on, the food system's largely been neglected in those talks. Mm-hmm. It's always been about energy and transportation. It's it. hardly been about food. So even in the US bill, the infrastructure bill, there's very little on food. Mm-hmm. Right? No one thinks about the food sector. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's arguing that the food system needs to be discussed at these COP meetings because you won't meet the Paris Agreement unless we change the way we grow our food. Excellent. Um, can you address the technology of indoor farming operations from a nutrition and climate change perspective? It cannot, unfortunately. Okay. That I don't know. Indoor being what, vertical or I'm not sure? I, I would assume... If anyone wants to comment on that in the chat box, feel free. Um, we'll sure do the next- you know more about that than I do. Yeah, we'll do the next one. Um, there's first a thank you for your presentation. Um, I know a lot of people who choose to supplement their diets with foods that come from outside agricultural systems, such as game, foraging, and wild caught fish. How mm-hmm. do you see those food sources fitting into the bigger picture? Definitely part of it. Okay. And there's many cultures that still, um, you know, rely on forests to get their food. They, they, they fish. Uh, the question is, is how do we do it sustainably? Right. And right. For, for many of these communities that rely on these wild foods, let's, let's think globally, um, tend to be indigenous populations that are very much in kinship with their, um, the ecosystem in which they live and, 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 um, seek their their food and culture from so mm-hmm. um they understand they, you know they understand how to do these things in a more sustainable way um it's it's when things get commercialized that become challenging yeah um, so but but hunting uh gathering foraging can all be part of a sustainable diet and can contribute a lot of nutritional diversity to the diet. Awesome. 
Um, are there other organizations in Maryland that are doing work to address food system changes to move towards equity and sustainability that you are aware of? I'm sure many of the master gardeners would be interested in connecting with others who are doing this work. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a lot actually. There's a lot of small farms of you know, organic farms that are in Maryland. My students go and visit um, a really great farm called, is it called the Good Dog Farm? It's a, a young couple that are kind of struggling. They live on about like 30 acres growing their own food. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of these farms and, and some, some on my team, I have a, a team, they um, work on, uh, there's one called Moon Valley Farm. Maybe some of you guys know, you guys might know these more, but I feel like there's a lot of these kind of farms that are doing some interesting um, work. And of course, you know, Baltimore has got a pretty strong uh, mm -hmm. food, food bank, food distribution yep. um, in, in the city of Baltimore. Um, that's, that is also really, really good. Yeah, I have if folks list, are familiar, and I also have a chat. list of black black owned farms in Maryland as well. If people want that, that I can send that around to you. Yeah, so. I can share that when we share your slides too. Yeah. yeah, awesome. All right, the next question is: What are some ways to impact changes in the highly processed meals that are served in school systems, where many children get most of their meals? Ugh, so difficult. Such a good question. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole school meal program is reliant, you know, it, it comes out of Congress and how, how that's interpreted, the menus and their procurement. There's a big push to try to improve procurement of school meals, the kind of foods that are procured. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, know, you, you get into US politics though, right? Around the farm bill. Um, so it's difficult, but there is a really great model out of Berkeley that some of you might know, Alice Waters. Um, what's it called? Some of you might know it. I'm an old lady. I can never remember anything anymore. <laughs> I can't remember, but it's a school garden project. That's a kind of an education project out of Berkeley. And, mm -hmm. and she's been trying to, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it. She's been trying to uh, proliferate this garden project all over. Um, yes, Edible Schoolyard, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah. And she's been trying to have that Edible Schoolyard kind of uh, model around the world now. She actually has some projects going on in Kenya to do that. That's a great project. Um, but yeah, procurement overall of school meals in the US is incredibly contentious with the, with the farm bill. But, you know, there's also procurement. Um, also think about other public facilities and, mm -hmm. and hospitals. If mm -hmm. any of you have spent time in hospitals, hopefully none of you have lately. But the, what you get in a hospital, the public procurement of hospitals is awful, mm -hmm. which is just ironic. Prisons, <laughs> what they're feeding prisoners, terrible. So it's all this whole public procurement model of mm -hmm. schools, prisons, hospitals. How do we improve that overall? Right. So For schools, if folks are interested locally, I would look into your um, closest extension county office SNAP Ed program because they do have a lot of work that they're doing with school gardens, but they also work to get um, at least one day or sometimes one week where they are serving all completely local produce for lunch in the cafeteria. So it's a small step, but it could be grown to be something nice. bigger, I think, if they had more partners and more folks involved. So definitely look look up your local uh, SNAP Ed office with extension. Brazil also has a really cool model of their national school meal school meals in which 25% of all the food procured for their schools has to come from local traditional foods from smallholder farmers, local smallholder wow. farmers. So it's called the home, Homegrown School Meal pr Program. And Brazil has really instituted that. That's, that's a great project. Awesome. 
And for those looking for more info about Edible Schoolyard, um, Sean shared a link in the chat. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, um, there was a map that you showed that had the percent of the population in each country and region that is not able to afford a healthy diet. Um, in the US, the percent was listed as less than 19%. And they were wondering how that data was determined. Yeah, um, I can send you the paper for that. I'll send okay. it, I'll put it in the chat now while we're sitting here. Awesome, thank you. This, this came out of the um, the 2020 Food and Agriculture Organization report. Um, let me send this to you guys. There's a report that comes out every year by the FAO. It's called the SOFI report, State of Food Insecurity and Nutrition Report. Okay. And in that report, they um, they present the world's uh, hunger numbers, that 811 mil million that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Last year's report had that diet data, and this was the background paper that has all the data. And it's led okay, by great. Anna Herforth, who uh, is in, lives in Boston. So you guys could also email her awesome. if you're interested in that data. Perfect. Yeah. So that link is in the chat box, folks, if yeah. you wanted to look at that paper. All right. Next question is, what would it take to encourage governments to subsidize healthier and more earth-friendly crops and practices rather than the U.S. current policies, which subsidize big commodity crops and monocultures? really hard to change um again kind of farm bill stuff but i think one important um one important thing could be to for those farmers who want to grow in the u.s sometimes they call them boutique crops like tomatoes mm -hmm. or boutique crops um which i find so odd but uh <laughs> those who do want to grow some of the fruits and vegetables should have better um you know weather insurance uh risk insurance kind of um options as part of their subsidy i mean it you know how do we shift away from that it, it's uh, this is one of these things that's so embedded again in the farm bill and this is the us right um mm -hmm that is, is, is a real kind of intractable situation, but, um, yeah, crop insurance is an important sort of incentive. I think for some of these farmers and some of the interviews that we did last year, um, mm -hmm. cause we were trying to propose as part of the summit, a background paper of how would you change subsidy policies? Okay. And, um, many argue that, in places like the US or Brazil, it's almost near impossible. You know, how would you completely shift the entire subsidy programs? Um, so it's a, it's a tough one. It's difficult. Yeah. But in places like in Africa, where they're starting to consider subsidy policies, it's a great way to influence that. Maybe the US model is not the best model for mm -hmm. a diet and environmental point of view. And maybe there could be other ways for farmers to yield profits. Um, Absolutely. So. Great. So we've got one more question that we'll close it out on. Are there any countries that have experimented with encouraging carbon sequestering, um, such as through cover cropping or leaving food fields fallow to improve the health of soil and to lessen greenhouse gases? How did these practices impact food systems where they've been tried, mm -hmm. if at all? Not sure if anything's been done at the country level. I mean, there's lots of different organizations who've been mm -hmm. promoting that with you know set, mm -hmm. sets of farmers, but not at the not at the national level. Not that I know of. Yeah. Okay. But lots of different groups that have been been promoting and pushing for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The EU has a new green. Too. The EU has a a, a whole new agriculture strategy that maybe some of you have heard about called uh, I, it's something like the green deal but and and they um are promoting agroecology and a lot of carbon sequestration but the 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 strategy just went into effect so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the eu over the next few years awesome great so we've made it through all of our questions i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording